What's up, guys? It's another episode of Pass Gas. This week we're talking about Juan Manuel Fangio and the IKA racing team over at the 84 Hours of Nürburgring race. It was an insanely long endurance race over there in the 60s. I cannot believe they actually did this, but uh, yeah, Juan Manuel Fangio brings an Argentinian motor company to Germany and tries his best to win that race. It's a really great story, uh, really impressive story, and I think we all gain a lot of appreciation for the country of Argentina. So sit back, and here's a story of IKA. Um, guess who I saw the other day? Who? Jenna Malone. Who's that? She's in Donnie Darko and Saved. She's kind of like Meek. Um. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know who you're talking about. Yeah. She's like this. Yes. Yeah, that's her. <laughs> <laughs> She's an indie darling. Oh, I've never seen that. She was an indie oh. darling. <laughs> I never been to Uva Java. <laughs> <laughs> she was an indie darling. She looks like the Matilda girl yes. grown up. Yeah. But she's not her. No. Not at all. <laughs> where was this? Did you say hi? It was like, at what was the hippest restaurant, you know, where like everyone walks up like this. Spago. The Ivy? Yeah. They all walk up like that. Yeah, yeah. And then there's a 45 minute wait, even yeah. at four o'clock. Chilies. On a Tuesday. <laughs> yeah. No, it's called Barro Santos. It's really cool. I think I've heard of that. I went there with Christina and. I just saw an article about that. Dude, it was so good. But uh, yeah, I went there with Christina at kind of an off time. I don't know. Maybe it was like dinner time. But they were like. <laughs> off time was dinner time. <laughs> I don't, I'm not trying to like. But they were I'm like, starting to do take. I'm getting used to the fact that we're shooting it. Yeah, and I'm starting to do takes to the camera. I love that. Yeah, <laughs> Jim from the office. As if to say, like, what the heck? Dinner time. Is but they like, were like, what we might idiot. be able to sit you in like an hour and forty five minutes. And what? Like, God. But there's also standing tables with this little jut thing that you're supposed to like. If I go to a restaurant, I'm not gonna. I don't want to stand. I don't want to stand. If I wanted to stand, it's like a tapas place. Yeah. Yeah. But it, the uh, food. Top notch. It was tapas Top, notch. Tapas notch. Oh, so nice. That's what Tapas notch on our restaurant. <laughs> tapas notch. I mean, that's pretty good. Tapas notch. That's like, uh, <laughs> like when I'm, uh, a pho place calls itself like forget about it. Yeah. yeah. Or what the pho. Yeah. I ate at Jelena last night, on the roof. What's that? Huh? That's so fancy. I've never heard of it. Jelena. Yeah. It's um, it's in Venice, but I th I didn't know they had dining on the roof. I drank, I ate on the roof, and you're like, there's no seating. It's just you're on the shingles. All right, I'm sure talking about hip restaurants has made us sound very hip uh, restaurants in our one city. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> In 1969, Argentina was a different place than it is today. Only three years after the violent overthrow of President Juan Perón by military dictatorship, it was a time of deep political unrest. And yet, amidst widespread protests and government crackdowns, the attention of the nation was stolen by an unlikely event at the Nürburgring. For three days straight, radios across the country buzzed with live coverage of a scrappy team of racers as they attempted the impossible at one of the longest endurance circuit races ever held. It wasn't a distraction that the people of Argentina looked for in the grueling trial of the Torinos at Nürburgring. It was hope, a dream that despite their country's tumultuous history, an Argentine team with Argentine cars could travel to Europe and not just compete alongside the world's best, but win. Today on Past Gas, why is a souped up coupe the pride of Argentinian racing? What was the Marathon de la Route? And who was the F1 superstar who showed those European car manufacturers who's boss? This is the story of the 84 hours at Nürburgring with the IKA Torinos. Big thank you to our sponsor this week, Valvoline Motor Oil. Extend protection, full synthetic high mileage is Valvoline's best performing motor oil ever for engines with more than 75,000 miles. If you've got a car with a bunch of miles like I do, you need Valvoline in your car. Get some today. Thank you very much, Valvoline. Thank you so much to Indeed for sponsoring this episode. 
Start hiring now with a $75 sponsored job credit to upgrade your job post at Indeed.com slash gas. Offer good for a limited time. Claim your $75 credit now at Indeed.com slash gas. Just go to Indeed.com slash gas and support the show by saying you heard about it on this podcast. That's Indeed.com slash gas. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. Thank you so much, Indeed. 84, 84 hours. hours. Jeez. You stay up for 84 hours. It's like a Ken Burns documentary. I've never done anything for 84 hours. I don't think I have either. It's like Ken Burns documentary. I, <laughs> I yes, you're correct. You did. You said it that? is like that. It is like I that. I don't remember. I think I made that up. <laughs> My girlfriend just got her Nurburgring taken out. <laughs> nice. Oh. <laughs> what is up with these tables? These tables are shaking all over the place. Yeah. For the listener, I think. Can you hear that? Can you? Can <laughs> Gavin's you hear that? laughing, so probably. Uh, so, these are the shakiest tables ever assembled prank. for a podcast studio. They've got no bracing at all. It's just the legs. I'm straddling two of them. So this I'm is a gross misunderstanding of how furniture works. Yes, that's uh, <laughs> an affront to God. Uh, I don't. I don't know. I don't know what the what's going on here. Normally these tables have a frame right. legs. Yeah. Yes. But there wasn't enough room in there. So someone just zapped on yeah. four legs. It needs some cross bracing. Needs some to cross help. brace to help. Yeah. Otherwise, yeah. We have an earthquake situation here in the Donut Podcast Studio. Welcome to Pass Gas, everybody. My name is Nolan Sykes. I will not be complaining about the tables for the rest of the episode. Not anymore. Not anymore. But that, I will be thinking about how to fix them. Yes, that's James Pump. We have metal in the shop. We got metal. We can Let's, do it. All right, time out. We got yeah. random scraps. We've got random scraps. Those voices you hear. James Pumphrey, across from me at the table. Speaking of random scraps, I'm here to bring y'all sweet, sweet history and also random scraps of humor and fun. <laughs> and mm-hmm. Joe Weber, what's up? Uh, slime off a of slug's back, Slug Nation. Oh, hell yeah. I love that, dude. I love that saying as well. Put and, that on a shirt. And make sure it's like a really gross shirt. <laughs> that's yeah. like always kind of wet. Bacon Pre-war. neck. Bacon. <laughs> yeah, Speaking bacon of neck. shirts, we have Pass Gas merch now at yes. donutmedia.com. Yes, we do. We've got a sweet Wink Wink Nation poster. Look at a that. Wink Wink Nation shirt. It's I really, a, really, I really love these a lot. It looks. We awesome. also have a sticker pack with exclusive stickers yes. that are only available in the same place that all of our other merch is. <laughs> Sold. So this poster says Wink Wink Nation on it. It's got a European Japanese inspired roadster. Not a Miata. With a pop up headlight winking at you. It's Not in the style a Miata. Of like a, it's in the style of like an old Volkswagen or Porsche ad. I'm really happy with it. It's We're not an really MX5. Happy. It's an MX PX. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Um, I've realized, dude. All right. So I walked the dog and I got to clean up her big turds. And our <laughs> yeah. dog is 80 pounds. That's <laughs> a big. Dog. Yeah, and her yeah, poops are big dog. way bigger than mine. Not just like bigger than mine, but it, way. It bigger. is weird how that works out. I wonder if that's because like all she eats is cereal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's, that's easy. It. All yeah. I, fe- I feed her cereal once a day. She's yeah. very regular. Very regular. <laughs> Every day at like seven thirty p.m., she gets a bowl of cereal. <laughs> but like. We've come to the evolution of two because dogs evolved with us from wolves. So like we've come to this evolution of these two species, and it's hit to the point where it's like, oh, yeah, we just didn't think about it. I have to have a bag that I carry mm-hmm. around to pick up her poop. Yeah, that's insane. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of people in LA that don't believe that, and they just leave dog shit on the sidewalk. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh, so, let's get into our story today. The Argentinian. IKA Torinos. 84 hours at Nurbur. I, I, you're right. Yeah, right. If you're up for 84 hours, you need to go to bed. What is that? <laughs> three and a half days? Mm hmm. Yeah. You'll start Why did they pick 84? Well, I'm sure we'll learn in this episode. No, I want to guess. <laughs> Let's guess. All right. Let's guess for guess. long. What, do you think I'm just a Google boy? <laughs> yeah, you think he's some kind of Google boy? He's not. <clears throat> I lost interest. <laughs> <laughs> What's going on over there? All right. Uh, <laughs> our story begins in 1956 in Santa Isabel, Cordoba, with the establishment of Industrias Kaiser Argentina. Cordoba. Cordoba. Maddie Cordoba. <laughs> Shouts to Matt. Like, right. without context, somebody is in their car being like, what the? Yeah. What are they? Why are you, Who is Matt? 
Matt's our friend. His last name's Cordova, and it sounds kind of like Cordoba. And that made me and Joe take us off track. Sorry. All right. Let's get back. I drank two Celsius. <laughs> Industrious Kaiser Argentina, better known as IKA, as we'll refer to it in the rest of the episode, was Argentina's first private automaker and was a joint union between American car company Kaiser Motors and the state-owned Industrious Aeronauticas y Mecanicas del Estado. I love the buns they make, too. The rolls. Kaiser rolls. I love a nice IKA beer. <laughs> IKA formed under the then president Juan Domingo Perón and was intended to solve a complex problem with a simple solution. Historically, guys, Argentinians tended to import their cars, but with the halt of imports during World War II and a lack of foreign currency to buy those imports afterwards, Perón and his government knew that if they wanted new cars, they'd have to make them. Then they got in touch with Kaiser Motors to supply the manufacturing equipment. If you've never heard of Kaiser Motors, that's not really a surprise because they're an old-ass company. Mm -hmm. But you might know them by their post-1953 merger name, the Willis Overland Corporation. Oh. Yeah, mm. makers of the famous and ubiquitous Willis Jeep. So it shouldn't come as a surprise that the first cars to roll off the floor at IKA were knockdown kit Jeep models. They followed that up in 1957 with the launch of the Estanciera, known in the U.S. as the Willis Jeep Station Wagon. Estanciera Nation. That's a pretty cool name. <laughs> Estanced. <laughs> nice. My British Japanese roadster is Estanced. It was the first mass market all steel station wagon and would go on to become the family car of the era and paradoxically set up Argentina's demand for off road vehicles. The sedan soon followed, based on the American-designed Kaiser Manhattan, renamed the Carabella. By 1958, IKA was producing an insane 81% of Argentina's locally manufactured vehicles, some 22,612 vehicles split between Jeeps and Carabella sedans. 1959 would mark a turning point for the plant when French automotive gods, Renault, purchased a minor stake in the company. With Renault's involvement, IKA began manufacturing various models from the brand, beginning with the adorable Delphine in 1960. It Delphines are smart. They're I so love cute. that name, Delphine. They've got Delphine. bigger brains than humans. <laughs> mm -hmm. Do they have more folds, though, is the question. Less folds, <laughs> more <laughs> mass. Uh. <laughs> a Delphine would know the answer. All right. However, these Argentinian Delphines were a little different than the French version, thanks to Argentinian regulations that required extra bumper bars. So these guys just get into the car game, and they're like, uh, actually, French regulations aren't strict enough for us. Let's have our own regulations. Dude, the French- Add some bumper bars. I think the French are pretty relaxed. They're like, you can, yeah, you can drink, drink wine in the car. Why not? Yeah, but eat they, a baguette. Uh, Those like, are the only things I know about France. They like bread and wine. Yeah, I can't wait to go there. It's cool. <laughs> I'm renting a Peugeot. Really? Oh, Peugeot cool. station wagon. In fact, that's cool. Yeah. Wow, that'd be cool. Uh, is it? No, I'm thinking of the Opal. Uh, I think I rented a Peugeot when I was in Italy. Peugeot. Is it diesel? No, I don't think so. But it is manual, apparently. That's cool. Oh, that's yeah. cool. Um, it's they drive on the right side, right? On the correct side. Yeah. On yeah. our side. On our. On our side. Oh, yeah. NATO. So you're not going to have to learn to shift with your left? No. No, but I can do that anyway. Yeah. When I did so that in, uh, when I went to Ireland, I put my driving sim on the other side oh, so nice. that I could practice. practice. Yeah. That's nice. That's a good That's idea. That's sick. So anyway, with the explicit intention of creating a national car, IKA conducted market research to see what the public wanted. Their conclusion was that it had to be fast, couldn't be too big, and please, can we get a sexier silhouette than the North American models? The people had spoken, and thus, the Torino was born. In the eyes of the people who built it and drivers who swear by it, the Torino is the best car to ever come out of Argentina. The stock models offered a choice of two inline six-cylinder engines, the most powerful of which was a 3.7-liter IKA-modified Jeep Tornado engine, which was fed by three 45-millimeter Weber Bologna side draft <laughs> carburetors. That thing was fun. You guys yeah, haven't dude. even touched your Weber Bologna yet. <laughs> when <laughs> I made it in my best bathtub, <laughs> my prison Bologna <laughs> <laughs> made it in a toilet. <laughs> what? Uh, it traded it mostly chewed up Slim Jim. <laughs> <laughs> ah. 
<laughs> when they put this engine inside the Torino 380W, the engine was good for 176 right. horsepower and 239 foot-pounds of torque. Yeah, I bet the thing was a riot. Yeah, man. Especially on them old tires. Oh, baby. Skirt, skirt. Skirt it Don't up. Don't cry for me, Argentina. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the car was beefy, but the Torino is a beautiful combination of American reliability and European elegance. The interior of the Torino and its overall presentation was far more regal than that of AMC's sportiest Rambler. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that's really saying something. <laughs> uh, thanks to the design by Pininfarina. All right. It was, ref it was as refined as the cabin of any Italian Grand Tour of the time. So you know it's got a big butt on it. We're talking really nice upholstered bucket seats for those big butts, Joe. No, no, the car has a big butt. Oh, well. It's now. got an okay butt. There's also a suite of shiny round instrument dials and wood trim wherever they could fit it. This thing sounds... So nice. It's pretty sick. Triple side jazz, little tiny tires. Yeah, dude. Pininfarina body. That's that's key right there. On November 30th of 1966 in Buenos Aires, the IKA Torino was unveiled to a public prime to adore it. And standing next to the car in a full black tie with his hand held high to the crowd was the man who made it all possible, the one and only Juan Manuel Fangio. Whoa! Yeah. That guy. Yeah, that guy. Dang, this thing is sick looking. It's really cool. It's pretty Ooh, cool. Ooh, I like that. I like that. Uh, no, uh, they like he. The yeah. AMC Rambler can't even hold a candle to this uh, car. You could full black you might tie. Say that means like tuxedo. <laughs> Me gusta. <laughs> <laughs> Muy bien. Muy bien. Muy bien. Students of the podcast might remember Fangio as the man kidnapped by Fidel Castro in episode 156. Yeah, that's the only reference you know of Juan Manuel Fangio. We made a bunch of refs to him. But he was kidnapped by Fidel Castro, uh, and we did a whole episode about it, episode 156. A cool wanna, story. Check it out. Yeah. It's good. That podcast is like a movie. Well, let's summarize him a little <laughs> bit in this episode. Okay. James is doing a, a take to the he camera. He just realized that there's cameras here. Yeah, now he's looking at the camera. I'm getting used to it. <laughs> We've been doing it for months. <laughs> so now I'm merging my two loves as being on camera and being on. Light. I realize that I touch my face a lot. You do? <laughs> yeah. So I'm sitting on my hands today. <laughs> Juan Manuel Fangio is one of the greatest Formula Uno drivers of all time. <laughs> A native Argentinian, he competed in seven full Formula Uno seasons. He was crowned world champion five times and runner-up twice. Pretty good record, if you ask me. Driving for teams like Alfa Romeo, Ferrari, Merck Benz, and Maserati. In his 51 championship Grand Prix, he started from the front row 48 times, including 29 pole positions, and set 23 fastest laps en route to 35 podium finishes. 24 of those, he stood on top of the box in first place. And he sprayed that champagne. Sprayed the champagne like a man. <coughs> <laughs> He's also the reason why Pininfarina, a company best known for designing Ferraris, decided to cook up a one-off design for a small car manufacturer in Argentina. Through leveraging his connections with both Argentine industry and Italian design, Fangio helped bring about the most refined and reliable sports car IKA ever made. But Fangio was eager to take things further. He didn't want to just make a car. He wanted to race it. Naturally. And not just anywhere. Fangio wanted to take the Torino to the same track he'd won on in 54, 56, and 57. I'm talking 19. <laughs> he wanted to bring the pride of Argentina to the green hell, the Nürburgring. Let's go. With the support of IKA and renowned mechanical engineer Oreste the Wizard Berta, Fangio launched his Argentine mission of 1969. I want to go to the Nürburgring and I want to bring the wizard with me. Yeah. <laughs> he gathered the most talented Argentinian drivers of the time as well as a group of efficient mechanics and set upon modifying three 380W Torinos for the trip to Germany. 
This time, the Argentinians are going to Germany instead of the other way around. <laughs> That's where a bunch of Nazis hit out after the war. Mm. The team reduced the Torino's weight by about 100 pounds and increased the engine output to 250 horsepower at 5,200 RPM, which is way lower than I thought it would be. <laughs> it gave the car a new top speed of 143 miles oh, per hour. That sounds fun. That sounds scary. That sounds fun and scary, just like being friends with you, you bad boy. <laughs> <laughs> but this wouldn't be any race around the Nürburgring. Fangio and his crew would be participating in the 1969 Marathon de la Route, a.k.a. the Nürburgring 84 Hours. It's too much. You know, when, too many hours. When I read the title of this podcast, I assumed it was 84 hours because of something <laughs> bad happening. But no, right off the bat, they were like, let's do it for 84. <laughs> it was a three and a half day battle of nonstop racing on Europe's toughest track. Let's just say things are going to get wild. <laughs> <laughs> Big old thanks to BetterHelp for sponsoring this episode of Past Gas. There's been a couple times in my life where I was uncertain of where I was going or what the next step was. And I got through it by taking a breath, figuring out what was important to me. Some people never get past that step, though. And sometimes in life, we're faced with tough choices, and the path forward is not always clear. Some people have mentors. Some people have to just figure stuff out for themselves. Whether you're dealing with decisions around career, relationships, or anything else, therapy helps you stay connected to what you really want while you navigate life so you can move forward with confidence and excitement. I think therapy is super beneficial for everyone, not just select few. And if you're new to therapy, I think BetterHelp is the best way to get into it. It's super easy. It's entirely online. You don't have to go to an office or anything. It's actually designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. So let therapy be your map with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash PassGas today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash PassGas. Thanks, BetterHelp. Big thank you to our sponsor this week, Valvoline Motor Oil. Valvoline's extended protection full synthetic high mileage is their best performing motor oil ever for engines with more than 75,000 miles. Old cars, they need an oil that can protect them from stuff like heat, friction, wear, and deposits that start to pepper themselves throughout your engine. But Valvoline Extend Protection Full Synthetic High Mileage is there for you and your car. This oil's got Ultra Max Life technology. It's the ultimate protection for vehicles with 75,000 miles or more. It prevents leaks and engine breakdowns in extreme situations. We've got Valvoline in all of our donut media project cars in our lot. I've got it in my car. And a lot of racing teams use Valvoline racing oil in their cars as well. So you can be assured that Valvoline is the motor oil for you. And uh, the results speak for themselves. My car still running like a champ. And I believe part of that is because of regular oil changes with Valvoline motor oil. Get some Valvoline in your car today, and I'll see you out there on the road. Thank you very much, Valvoline. The Marathon de la Route started off as a far-flung 2,000-mile road race from Belgium to Rome and back, known as the Liège-Rome-Liège Rally. <laughs> it was almost 90 hours of constant racing and a true test of endurance that ran through six countries and more than 30 mountain passes. I play this game called Travel. And you have mm -hmm. to connect countries in the shortest possible way. Yeah. It's like and Wordle, sort of, but in, with countries. In my head, I am already doing Belgium to Italy. And Didn't it's, you mention this last week, too? Yeah, it's uh, an addiction. Are they? I can't, <laughs> stop. I can't stop playing it. It's a really fun game. With the sharp rise of traffic in Europe in the 60s, though, organizers knew that this race had to move. So that's why they chose the Nürburgring and renamed the race the Marathon de la Route. It didn't take long for major European manufacturers like Porsche to start using Marathon de la Route as a testbed for their latest development projects. Turns out it was cheaper to run in the race than to pay the Nürburgring privately. That's a good yeah, mark to around. Rent it. That actually makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Back in the Liège-Rome-Liège days, hundreds of racers would turn out. But the 1965 Marathon de la Route only had 35 competitors. The 82-hour race was won by Mustang, piloted by French rally driver Henley Gradier and his co-driver, automotive sports journalist Johnny Rives. 
Uh, Germans Rainer Ising and Bernd Degner. I feel like we've heard that name Bernd, before. That person needs some vowels in their name. <laughs> Bernd Degner. <laughs> the Germans Rainer Ising and Bernd Degner were the GT class winners that year in a Porsche 904 GTS after their major competitor dropped because of a busted rear axle, axle with less than an hour to go. And with that, we establish two recurring themes of the Marathon de la Route. One, Porsche does really well. Of course. And two, this race eats cars. That's so a, does the Iron Giant. That's a shirt right there. <laughs> this race eats cars. This race eats cars. That These a, colors yeah. don't bleed. This race eats cars. <laughs> At the Marathon de la Route, the line between victory and defeat often came down to reliability rather than outright performance. As it did back then. These colors don't bleed. This machine kills fascists. This race eats cars. That's what I was thinking Printed. of with this machine eats fascists. Mm, that's, kills. See, uh, that's cool. Uh, yeah. Stick that on my guitar. Stick that on my <laughs> guitar, Willie Guthrie. In 1966, the Can race... You milk me? <laughs> 1966, the race time was increased to 84 hours. 67 and 68 saw Porsche dominate against a field of Mini Coopers, DAFs, Lanchas, and Mazdas. Despite the success of the previous Liège-Rome-Liège rally, grids still weren't picking back up. Both 67 and 68 saw only 43 cars entered, and on a huge course like the Nürburgring, and was... <laughs> I mean, you're going to get spread out. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's mm. a boring race to watch. Oh, yeah. I Don't make promises that. you can't keep. Pass That's gas another cash. Shirt. You're going to get spread out. <laughs> <laughs> but, James. But, James is what I'm talking about. 1969 was different. You're going to get spread I'm out. Talking about spreading your butt? Okay. <laughs> yep. <laughs> 1969 was different, though. The Marathon de la Route was notorious for its strict rules and penalties. But this year, the rules were quite straightforward, guys. Previously dependent on average lap times, the covered distance would now be the only deciding factory for glory. But there would still be penalties, okay? Every pit stop that went over a minute would suffer a one-lap penalty. Noise. If a pit stop went over 15 minutes, the car would be disqualified. And finally, the maximum lap time allowed would be a mere 30 minutes. You can't do anything in a minute back then. Would you just fill it yeah, up with gas? Yeah, what if you gas? have like a you huge? A up, what if you have like something break, or you have to replace brake pads? Or yeah. Then you have like fifteen minutes to fix it. That's insane, dude. Um, yeah, it is kind of silly. But if you think about it, a lot of time can be made up in eighty-four hours. Mm -hmm. That's true because everyone's gonna have issues they're gonna have to fix. Yeah. Um, but that's like that's nuts. Um, the field this year was also quite different. Sixty-four cars were signed up. We had Alfa Romeos, BMWs, Datsuns. Fiat's, Ford's, Lancia's, Mazda's, Mercedes's, Porsche's, Renault, and Volvo's were all in attendance. And Juan Manuel Fangio was set to pit his Torino's and a team of drivers who had never seen the Nürburgring against veterans of the track backed by industry okay. titans. Okay. This what? is a fight. What's, okay. Gun to your head. Which yeah. team do you pick? Porsche. Uh, I mean, I'm going to have to go with the Torinos just based no, on I mean, the fact which, that we're doing this podcast. <laughs> which team would you drive for? Oh, Porsche. Yeah. Yeah, me too. <laughs> Volvo would be fun, though. Uh, They probably had one of those cool... Uh, ironically. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, if you lived over on the east side. Yeah, maybe, maybe. if you live in... And you're going to Bar Mosuvio like you go to... <laughs> Masubi. <laughs> Where you guys stand up and eat your steaks. <laughs> when I eat my steaks, I like to sit down. On a toilet, preferably. <laughs> <laughs> also have a shower in close proximity. I need that. Oh, what, what was that show Matt Walsh had? So it was like a show about a news crew. Mm -hmm. Oh, is it Man Eat Dog? Yeah, Man Eat Dog. Yeah, I love that show. Yeah, and so like Matt Walsh was just a terrible character. Yeah. And he had to share a room with like someone... Who, like, and it was, like, the awkward situation. But he was eating a steak on the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> like, when did it, this whole thing, and he was like, I just want to eat a steak. He's like, yeah, but why are you on the toilet? He goes, because I hate the smell of steak. <laughs> <laughs> so funny. Dog was Bites Man. Dog Bites, Dog Bites Man. Man. Zach yeah. Alphanakis is in it. Zach, yeah. Really Matt funny. Walsh, one of my early and probably most hands-on mentors. The uh, actor Matt Walsh. Yeah, actually, should Matt be Walsh. noted. Yeah. I know another another Matt Walsh. He's a graphic designer. Ah. There's also a, a stand-up named Matt Walsh. Holy well. Moses! That's a pretty common name. Yeah. I met another Joseph Weber this weekend. Did you? Kill yeah, him? they actually did you fight? mixed up. 
our tabs at the bar I was at and I was like, what's this? And they're like, oh, uh, and then he came over and he was like, I thought there was another Joe Weber. Here. I thought there was another <laughs> Joe Weber there. I didn't, I didn't order 11 jelly smoothies. <laughs> and you're yeah. like, oh, sorry, that's mine. <laughs> yeah. I had to explain what a jelly smoothie was then <laughs> after that. Just take a lot of tequila, yeah. more than you think, add some. Smucker's grape jelly. Ooh, I did discover what my favorite drink is, though, because my friend got it. It's Malibu coconut rum, pineapple juice, and a squeeze of lemon. It's so good. I mean, that sounds like it's pretty It's tasteful. delicious. <laughs> Make me sick. Yeah. It's, <laughs> I could only drink one. But it's, like, <laughs> yeah, it's like uh-huh. a thousand grams of sugar. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, that, that is not very strong, either. No. Malibu is like 12%. <laughs> Are, and then when you mix... <laughs> Pineapple juice into it. Is your friend like a freshman in high school? <laughs> no, he's a he's a, a big metalhead. He's uh-huh. like probably three hundred pounds. He's our pitcher. He's covered in tattoos, and he's an accountant. But he also makes candles for RuPaul. Whoa! Hmm. Yeah. What a life. Yeah. Wow. Maybe we'll do a podcast about him one day. <laughs> After arrival at the Nuremberg Ring, the three Torinos were honored with the numbers Uno. Dose and Trace. For our American listeners, that's one, two, and three. (laughs) Whether this was due to Fangio's prestige as a five-time world champion or the off-sided anecdote that officials believe the Torinos would be the first to drop, Hmm. we may never know. I mean, look, I love going to country and I love your food, but your cars are Your cars are Maybe one, I sent you a drop at first. And number two, I sent you a drop at second. And number three, I sent you a yes. drop out third. Oh, your name is Juan? Is that the position you're going to drop out in? Didn't you guys do a Holocaust like 20 years ago? Shut up! <laughs> Shut up! <laughs> Didn't you do a Holocaust? <laughs> Shut up! We're not supposed to talk about that. In Torino number one, we had Luis de Palma, Carmelo Galbato. That's a sick name. Carmelo Galbato? Yeah. It is. And Oscar Espinosa, Luis think. Loco de Palma. Oh, so cool. Sick. So cool. That means crazy in Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> he was a future motorsports legend. He had been racing his entire life. He started off on motorcycles before getting behind the wheel of a stock car, winning the Turismo Carretera, the longest running race series in the world, on his second try at the age of 20. How have I never heard of that before? Because you've been looking in the wrong place. As soon as you stop looking. I'm not it, a Google boy. I'm never going to be a Google I'm boy. I'm not a Google boy. I find everything I need to know under my porch. <laughs> <laughs> You can learn a lot about the world looking under a rock. That's what I say. That's what Patrick from SpongeBob says. To <laughs> yeah. All I know is roly polies. <laughs> Carmelo Galbato was originally from Italy, known for winning in Fords. He was the co-star to Fangio in the 1968 film Turismo de Carretera. When he and Fangio were interviewed about driving in the Turismo. Carretera. <laughs> the final driver of the number one Torino was Oscar Espinosa, the unrecognized son of Juan Manuel Fangio. What? Whoa. Whoa. Maybe you want to drive a car for me? Sure, Papa. Don't call me that. <laughs> Oscar was the product of Fangio's long term relationship with Andrea Baru that ended in 1960 and followed in his father's footsteps to become a nationally renowned driver. Dude, that's that's so sick. It wasn't until 2015 when Oscar petitioned the government to exhume Juan Manuel's body that he was able to confirm the paternity. Oh. And at the age of 77, finally. Take his father. Wow. That's a pretty. I mean, that's a pretty big bet you're taking. By the way, it's a big bet. You petition also, the government, and you're like, look. I mean, if you're wrong, you look like an idiot. But yeah. also, dude was 77 years old. Obviously, lived his entire life with some feelings. Yeah, yeah. Man, that's sad. at least he got some closure. Yeah. Wow. I guess so. That is. That's wild, man. Yeah. It's so weird that like <laughs> he denied his that he was his father, and then. Brought him on to race with him. I mean, that's like that's a, like a, I, that's a I, sick I, element in the movie, guys. This is a great yeah. movie. That feels guilt-driven, you know. Or yeah. just like undeniable talent. 
I will never let this guy be my son, but goddamn, if you can't drive, <laughs> yeah, I'm, drive. Well, I'm not changing a diaper, drive, but I yeah. will give him, a, we'll give him a steering wheel. You can't have my name, but you can have what ticket you can to have the Nurburgring. Oh, not literal son, by the way. Yeah, yeah I meant like aha, like, uh-huh, like yeah. Son, I call like all my the, friends uh-huh son. Aha, sense. Yeah, yeah. You know, not like in the not oh, like, come here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, like in the aha, uh-huh, son. Yeah. It's a colloquialism. Yeah. Don't take yeah, it yeah. literally. Don't take it literally. Quit being weird. Yeah. Stop crying. Exhume my body. <laughs> exhume my body. Exhume my body when I'm dead. Torino number two was piloted by drivers Gaston Perkins, Eduardo Rodriguez Canedo, and Jorge Cupiero. Gaston was known best for being in Beauty Hitting the Beast <laughs> and second best for racing. Marie, the baguettes! <laughs> <laughs> and also for driving the tiny Renault Dauphine Gordini. Ooh. Winning three consecutive Turismo Nacional Class B titles between 1963 and 1965. But this wasn't Gaston's first time behind the wheel of a Torino. Tragically, only two years earlier, Gaston was involved in an accident that resulted in the death of fellow racer Norberto Polinori. Polinori was inspecting his car for damages after a collision and was struck by Gaston. Oh, my God. He was struck by Gaston in an AKA Torino 380W, the very same car Gaston would drive at the Nürburgring. That's, ugh, such a bummer because you're not even driving your car. So many dramatic elements to the story already. You, know, got the, you got the the father yeah. hood mm-hmm. thing. Yeah. You got a guy racked with guilt over killing a fellow racer. Right. Yeah. We see that part in black and white. I was going to say, like, we have so many elements yeah. of this story. We'd have to sit down and say, what devices are we going to use yeah. to introduce all these interesting You aspects. got your natural tension with the xenophobia of the oh, yeah. Germans and the Argentinians. The Germans and the Argentinians like each other, though. Yeah, I mean, Germans love how hospitable the Argentinians are, yeah. but when they come back over, they're, I don't know. You got a night, you got a funny scene where the Argentinians get on the plane to Germany and like they see it's just full of Germans. Yeah. They're like, oh, hi. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Argentinian. Uh, the I'll guy take a sheepishly Coke. puts a newspaper in front of his face yeah. to protect his identity. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Like suspiciously, like Hitler. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Adolfo Hitlieri. <laughs> <laughs> Eduardo Rodriguez. <laughs> People Canada. watching the movie are like, what the f- <laughs> What is this movie? <laughs> why is that he's airplane? A he's in one scene and then he's never mentioned again? <laughs> yeah. well, why is the airplane scene 25 minutes long? Yeah. It has nothing to do with anything else. Why did Hitler have dreadlocks? We just had a heartbreaking <laughs> scene of Juan Manuel Fangio like rejecting his son <laughs> to this? Why was there a guy who looked like Hitler with like half cornrows, like a white girl <laughs> <laughs> on vacation? <laughs> <laughs> he's really sunburnt. Yeah, he's super sunburnt. <laughs> A special thanks to WD40 Brand for sponsoring this week's episode of Past Gas. Have you heard the news? WD40 Brand has a new product that is a force to be reckoned with. The all-new WD40 Precision Pen. Ever heard of it? Maybe try crack book sometime. What I love about this new product is that it's the same original WD-40 formula from the blue and yellow can with the red top that we all know and love, all in a portable pocket size format. Apply the original WD-40 formula with pinpoint precision thanks to the pen's controlled flow applicator, which allows you to disperse the right amount of product even in the tightest of spaces. Without needing to spray, the WD-40 Precision Pen gives you the power to lubricate, protect, and loosen up rust on any project, in any environment, at any time. Keep one in your toolbox, one in your pocket, and anywhere else you might need the help of the original WD-40 formula. No matter where you choose to stash your Precision Pen, it has your back to help you tackle any job. It's time to take control and apply with precision with the new WD-40 Precision Pen. Now available at Amazon, visit WD40.com to learn more. Thanks, WD40. Big thank you to longtime sponsor of Past Gas. It's Indeed. That's right. If you're hiring for your business on your own, you're basically doing it on hard mode, okay? I'm talking like playing Dirt Rally with no assists on. It's hard, okay? But all you got to do is what I do when I'm playing really hard games. You need to breathe 
Take it easy and keep it simple, okay? If you're hiring, you need Indeed. Here's why. Indeed is the hiring platform where you can attract, interview, and hire all in one place. Indeed streamlines hiring with powerful tools that find you matched candidates. I want to tell you guys today about Indeed's hiring platform. Candidates you invite to apply are three times more likely to apply to your job than candidates who only see it in search according to US Indeed data. And Indeed does the hard work for you. Indeed shows you the candidates whose resumes on Indeed fit your description immediately after you post so you can hire faster. Start hiring now with a $75 sponsored job credit to upgrade your job post at Indeed.com slash past gas. Offer good for a limited time. Claim your $75 credit now at Indeed.com slash past gas. Just go to Indeed.com slash past gas and support the show by saying you heard about it on this podcast. That's Indeed.com slash past gas. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. Eduardo Rodriguez Canedo was hot off two championship wins at the Turismo Nacional and was already familiar with the Torino since he drove the 380W to victory in 1967. The final driver of car number two was Jorge Cupiero, who competed in more than 300 motorcycle races in Argentina and Chile before switching to car racing at age 23. He competed mainly in the Turismo Carretera with 15 wins and a runner-up championship in 1965. This brings us to Torino number three, piloted by Alberto Rodriguez Lareda, Eduardo Copello, and Oscar Mauricio Franco. Loretta, who raced under the name Larry. <laughs> <laughs> That's like when you see Lawrence Fishburne in old movies and he's Larry Fishburne. Larry Fishburne yeah. Like, you're not a Larry. <laughs> yeah. So Larry was the third funniest dude. <laughs> And one of the most versatile Argentinian drivers, known for driving single-seaters, sports cars, and Turismo Carretera cars. Can we all agree that Shemp was the least funniest? Oh, Shemp was. He was kind of creepy. Yeah. I mean, everybody back then was. Yeah, I was watching, uh, I watched the opening of Wizard of Oz because it was on the front page of Max when I downloaded it. And, like, I couldn't get over, like, one, you're not supposed to watch that movie in HD. It's Why? just terrifying looking. Oh, really? Just like really weird and creepy. Did it have like the motion blur too? Like that? It's just like the makeup's weird and yeah. it's just, you can just see the abuse that they like. Oh, put God, that's through. the snow that was just asbestos. Uh huh. Yeah. <laughs> and like it, like the, the good witch, her teeth are just so yellow. <laughs> and like it just made me realize, like, dude, everybody in there was just chief and cigs between yeah. takes. Just like, and now, whenever I look at an old movie, I'm just like, that person smells like cigarettes. Yes. All these people just smell like cigs and booze, probably. Yeah. Gross. I smell like Celsius and cardio. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. I smell like gains and wiry shreds. <laughs> Like many drivers, Larry's dad was an amateur driver who had won the 1924 Grand Prix de Marseille and tried his best to get his son interested in his hobby. When Larry was only six, his father designed a child-sized electric Bugatti Type 52 that Larry would putz around That's it. Sick. That's super sick. Eduardo Copello also came from money. His father was a winemaker and he was nicknamed El Cardinal in memory of his uncle. The first cardinal appointed by the Vatican to Argentina. And look at where the, we are now. We got an Argentinian pope. <laughs> oh, how we've come so far. <laughs> Copella was an immensely talented driver and won the Turismo Carretera in 1967, finished runner-up in 68, and came back to win the Formula B class in 1970. Trino number 3's last driver was Oscar Mauricio Franco, the younger brother of the two Oscars, Franco, was only 24 years old and known for racing Fiat's. Though none of the pilots had ever driven the Nürburgring's nearly 200 corners, Fangio tutored the team in the days before the race as he walked them through every detail of the difficult circuit. This advice could be summed up with three rules. Use high gears and curves, maintain an even rhythm, and take care of the tires and brakes. The moment had come. 
The three Torinos and their drivers lined up against the world on August 20th at 1 in the morning. Engines fired up in the 1969 Marathon de la Route. That's crazy one that they started the at 1 a.m. What the heck? So then they would end at 1 on the third day. 1 p.m.? Yeah. 1 p.m., yeah. yeah. That's pretty smart. Sense. That's a good time to end, but like, geez. This is back when the Nürburgring was even crazier, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, so, being 1 in the morning... The race began under darkness, punctuated only by bolts of lightning oh, cool. and torrential rain. Great conditions. Right off the bat, the Torinos actually led the way, screaming down the tree-lined course. The number two and number three Torinos were leading, followed by Lancia's Fulvia race cars. Track flooding led to many crashes in those early hours, and the storm doubled down with renewed force at noon the next day. By lap 41, Jorge Cupiero who was piloting the second Torino, became disoriented in the rain and unfortunately crashed. The number two Torino was disqualified. Two of the three Lancias racing suffered an identical fate. Finally, the rain stopped and darkness and thick fog descended, leading to more major crashes. Participants were forced to stop for both major and minor repairs. Good Lord, by the 23rd hour, we still have... (laughs) 60 hours to go? (laughs) Uh, Torino number three was still in first place of the race. Fangio and his crew were becoming excited. Maybe, just maybe, they could actually win this thing. And those watching the race thought the same thing. In the audience and over the airwaves, in a dozen different languages, commenters were repeating three common words. Torino, Fangio, and Argentina. Torino. At hour 48... Two days into the race. Oh God. <laughs> Two full days. That's day three. Torino, number one's lights, suddenly failed. Driver De Palma, driving now blind, <laughs> tried to maintain the course, but ran off the road. Torino, number one, was disqualified. That's such a bummer because that's like not even a mechanical failure. I know. Really. It's a weird thing. The fate of the Torinos would lay with the final car, number three. The number three Torino was still leading the race, but the competition was fierce with Lancia. Both teams only had one of their three starting cars left, and they continuously swapped positions through the night. By Friday morning, with the end in sight, calls from the Adenau police came flooding in, threatening to cancel the race if the participating cars didn't have a proper exhaust system. This seems like a... This is definitely in the movie. Yeah. Like, oh no, they're they're winning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. (laughs) As it turned out, many of them, including the number three Torino, uh, had been damaged or lost during the course of the event. Just their, their tailpipes just fell right off. Legend has it that under the threat of disqualification, the number three Torino, driven by Larry at this point, pulled off to attempt a roadside repair without the help of a mechanic, per the regulations. While Larry sped to complete the fix before receiving a penalty, who should approach the wire fence but Juan Manuel Fangio, who was singing repair instructions to the melody of the famous song La Camparcita? That is so cool. That's such a great moment in our movie that we were going to make. <laughs> Despite their valiant efforts, a Ford Capri took the win that morning. After the repair, the Torino battled Lancia's last Fulvia and a rotary engine Mazda. But it was no use. Somehow that rotary engine lasted that long. So would it that would have been a Cosmo or an RX2? I think you might be right, Joe. Uh, the remaining number three Torino finished the race with the most laps of any car, but due to the penalties incurred during the exhaust repair, they officially classified in fourth place. Regardless, though, celebrations erupted in the box. Fangio and Areste Berta were hoisted on the shoulders of their drivers and paraded around the room. Why the abundant joy, you ask, James? Why the ecstatic celebration, Joe? And why was this fourth place finish one of the greatest achievements in Argentinian racing? Why is this an intro? (laughs) Fangio's Argentine mission was never about winning the race. Uh. Obviously, a first place finish would have been awesome. Duh. Duh. (laughs) But the truth is, nobody cared about the final classification in Argentina. Juan Manuel Fangio and his team showed that Argentina could run with the best of Europe on Europe's toughest circuit. And together, they proved the Torino was equal to BMW, Porsche, Alfa Romeo, and Lancia. Fangio's mission 
was one of national unity, of pride in a time of genuine strife, and in those respects, it was an overwhelming success. I think that's a great success. Argentina might not be the first country to pop into your head when you think of legends in automotive history, but Juan Manuel Fangio and the nine pilots of the IKA Torino are more than deserving of that title. Rather than a one-off success story from an oft-overlooked part of the world, the tale of the Torino shines a light on a unique racing legacy born out of passion for motorsport. Walk the streets and markets of Buenos Aires today, and alongside posters of cultural staples like football, beef, and yerba mate, I'm no Google boy. Those are off the top of my head. (laughs) Most often than not, you'll find the striking silhouette of the Torino. It's a cultural icon, and it's not in spite of Argentina's history that the Trino has risen to such symbolic heights. It's because of it. This story, like the car, like the drivers, and like the country, is uniquely Argentine to its core. I think that's cooking meat on fire. Yeah. (laughs) My meat is on fire. My meat is on fire. (laughs) I just realized I had. I know it's not the same car, but there's an orange Gran Torino parked on my street. That's a different car. I know. Totally different. <laughs> different company. But that is cool. Car, but yeah. it is cool. Um, I got curious and looked up Turismo Carrera Terra. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, these cars are pretty interesting. They look like, uh, I, I would say, late model stock cars here in okay. the U.S., but they got like some really weird uh, flat wing on the back as part of the body work. Uh and they're they're, they're sent they they Carrera Terra Carrera Terra Turismo Carrera Terra Turismo Carrera Terra 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 These things are pretty sweet though. They race at road courses around Argentina. They have some pretty gnarly wrecks, um, but they're dope. They're cool. Wrecks. Smells like maybe we got to do an episode on it. I mean, we sure. Yeah, sure. Hey, what's up, guys? My name is Tanner. Sup, Tanner? We get a Sup, what, Tanner? What, what, Tanner? Sup, Tanner? 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 I'm a longtime follower of Donut Media, and I've listened to every past gas episode. Oh, thanks, man. I just finished listening to the Miata episode for the second time. <laughs> <laughs> Nolan, I know how you feel. Oh. I'm a beefy boy at 6'2", and I'm all torso. <laughs> Hell yeah, dude. Torso gang. <laughs> I will never fit in a Miata or any car in similar size. I guess it just isn't meant to be. Ever, ever. <laughs> <laughs> Podcast idea. Oh, hit the alert. Er, er, er. Podcast idea I had was <laughs> to talk about the history of BMW. From M cars to passenger cars, they are a staple in the car world and probably always will be. I'm also curious about the battles between the German sports cars during the 80s and 90s. Anyway, you guys are my heroes, and if there's any job I could have, it'd be yours. So watch your fat backs. <laughs> what? Wait, what? <laughs> what? Oh, hold up, hold Tanner, up. dude. I'm gunning for you. <laughs> I love what you guys do. So please keep it up. Thanks for reading. Toot toot, baby. Toot toot. Thank you, Tanner, for your, your email. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you so much for supporting the show. BMW, definitely. Christina, Put write it, it down. List. Write it down. I have a BMW, Greg. Can you milk me? All right. If you'd like to get in contact with the show, hit us up at Pascas Podcast at donutmedia.com. Follow the boys on all social media at James Pomfrey, at Joe G. Weber. Follow me at Nolan J. Sykes if you'd like to. Big thank you to our producers, as always, Christina Felsky and Gavin Kinzel, and our writer this week, Nathan Blue. Keep it blue, dude. Yeah, dude. I don't know what that means. Uh, oh, yeah. And also, big thank you to Nick Giamuso. Unsung hero, Nick Giamuso. The workhorse of Donut Media. The moose. Um, yeah. So tell a friend about the show if you haven't already. Yeah. Write a nice review. Uh-huh. Buy some Donut Media Pass Gas merch. At DonutMedia.com. Wink, Guys, wink Nation. I've had to pee since we introduced Fangio. All right. Well, let's get you out of here. <laughs> All right. Bye. 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 Bye.